My name is Fish and I'm an executive producer and one of the creators of the Cleveland Show. How did you get your start in the business? Um, I went a pretty indirect way about it. I went to law school, and after law school, was a prosecutor in New York, and all the while, wanted to be a comedy writer, which I had wanted to do from the time I was 14. I just didn't really know how to do it. And uh, finally, when I was approaching my 30th birthday, I figured it was either now or never. And so I spent early mornings and weekends writing what they call spec scripts. You're, you know, kind of on speculation. Nobody's going to pay you for them in advance, but they become your writing samples and submitted them to an agent who liked them. And then he, in turn, submitted them to um, a couple of shows that were my favorite at the time. And one of those was uh, The Simpsons. And the man who was running The Simpsons, a guy named David Merkin, who himself had come from a different background. He had been an engineer and then went into comedy. So I always assumed that made him a little sympathetic to somebody who was looking to break in from a completely different career. Uh, and he gave me a 10-week chance, followed by a second 10-week chance, and then that turned into about four and a half years. Do you think your education at Harvard helps you with your career now? Um, well, here's the thing. I think wherever you go to school, uh, you know, I don't want to sound like a, you know, everybody's parent, but I think education is always going to help you, and especially in, in writing and especially in comedy writing, because... Most of the shows I've been on, The Simpsons, Family Guy, Hidden Show, are chock full of references to things and parodies of things, and not just of TV shows that we all watched when we were kids, but books and plays and, you know, Greek tragedy or something, just for a cutaway joke on Family Guy, whatever it is. So the more you've learned, I think the more you have to draw on. And then, for me, I think college, whether it was, you know, at Harvard or wherever else it could have been, just gives you a chance to write a lot if that's what you want to do, that you can find it, you know, an extracurricular activity that uh, measures your success by how much you write for them, whether it's the human magazine or the newspaper or whatever it is. And the more you write, I think the better you get. It's, it's like a lot of things, you know, practice helps. And uh, I know that I think I'm a better writer because I spent a lot of my college years, not just as a person who major in history and literature is that I read a lot of books and write a lot of papers, but as somebody who spent a lot of my time outside of class working on the student newspaper and the student humor magazine and just constantly writing stuff, lots of it was lousy, but it's good to start getting that, you know, out of your system or at least to do it enough that you start recognizing that rare moment when you've done something that's good and then you can say to yourself, well, wait a minute, everything else is crap you know, that I wrote in the last month, because this is one thing that's good. Um, and I think anything that helps you develop your standards for your own work is helpful. So in that way, I, I continue to draw on what I did in college, what I learned in college. Uh, and then if I'm really, you know, uh, I take a clear eye to everything. I think having been on the Human Magazine and Heartbreak Lampoon was something of a you know, credit almost. It was as if I had almost been on a TV show because right around the time I was bringing into the business, a little before that, is when a lot of, or several people at that point from the Harvard Lampoon uh, came out to California to work on shows and play The Simpsons. And so I didn't really, David Merck didn't. Uh, and I'm trying to think, I think there was one or two people well, maybe two or three, now that I think about it. On the staff back then, I knew one of them, but I think that probably by that point, it was already another piece of experience that got someone like David Merkin to read my scripts. I think if he, you know, didn't like them, that would have been the end of it. But I'm, I, I, I never asked him, but I would imagine that, you know, knowing that I'd been on the humor magazine there, maybe made him a little more interested to read the script to see if he'd like it. So... I think in that regard, going to Harvard was certainly, certainly didn't hurt. I don't think it got me the job, but I think it helped. As the executive producer, um, what exactly are your responsibilities at the show? Well, it's, in TV, you know, writers rise up to the ranks, and by the time you become an executive producer or a showrunner, you are, in effect, 
you know, the head writer, um, and you are kind of the, you know, we have supervising directors who are very talented artists who have risen up the ranks through the uh, animation side, but in the end, it's the executive producer who doesn't just decide what goes in the scripts and what stories we write and how we rewrite them, but you sit in the editing room and you figure out how to edit the episode down to the proper length. You sit with the composer and go through the episode and spot it for music. You listen to the tracks that the composer sends and give notes. You either say it's great or you might have a response about how to change something. You go to the mixes towards the end of the process where they're putting in all the sound effects and you give notes on that. So every, every aspect of production, you're kind of the last call. It's kind of akin to being, you know, in the movie business, the director is that person. And in the TV business, it'll, you know, jump in and out of different rooms during the day. I always think it's like, you know, there's uh, planes on the runway ready to take off. So as soon as you turn your attention from one, there's like six or seven staring you down. You know, you have to go help, you know, edit one episode or cut one episode at a time or go and listen. You know, the whole process, there's so many elements, but it's, you know, you, you'll hear a story idea, you'll break that story, you'll assign the outline, the outline will come back in, you'll give notes to the writer in the outline. The first draft comes in, you then give notes as you rewrite it in the room, you know, sometimes from page one, sometimes not. Uh, then it'll be tabled with the cast, then they record it. Then you go into an editing booth and you cut the audio track down because it's always going to be too long for them to animate. We always write a little too long. Then once they do that, then you meet with the artist to go to a storyboard review about how they picture certain scenes and how you picture them that might be different. You kind of hash that all out. Then you have the rough animation that you give notes on, then the color animation. And then you're back to where I was when I started, you know, putting the music in, putting the sound effects in, cutting it down to final appropriate length to air. There's a lot of steps and any one time, if it takes nine or ten months of getting to end with one of these episodes of Power Show or Family Guy or Simpsons, you have maybe four or five shows you're actively working on at once. The one that's going to be read by the cast the following week, the one that the rest of the nation came back on two days ago, the one that the color animation came back on the day before. You know, there's always a lot of balls in the air. That's crazy. Yeah, it, I mean, it keeps you, it's, it's, it's exciting and interesting because there's always something new, but sometimes you do stop in the home and you're being asked a question, you think, all right, wait a minute, what episode is this? What's happening in it? Because your head is swimming with a bunch of stories. Even a new one that you might be trying to break in the writer's room and you think, wait, 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 Cleveland still hadn't met this character in this episode. We're working on a later episode. Okay, okay, what was the question? And you really kind of have to talk yourself through it to remember where you are. Uh... Because, like I said, you're you're dealing with an episode that might air a month or might air in ten months. Was Cleveland the first character for uh, that was a choice for spin-off? a spinoff? Yeah. Yes, it was. It was the only character Seth thought of spinning off, and um, you know I've been with him. But people have asked him why not Quagmire, and that seemed to be the question we always got. And Seth's response was, "You wouldn't want to watch a show about a rapist," and he's only <laughs> half joking. And I think. My theory is this. I think that one of the reasons people always ask us about Quagmire is because he is, he is and I think Seth would say this too, in a, in a really good way, a more identifiable and already defined comic character. You kind of know what a Quagmire joke is. You know where his comedy gold is going to be. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that works on a show like The Simpsons and Family Guy where you want characters like that to surround your lead. You know, Peter Griffin, Stewie, you know, it, they're the stars of that show, and so you want to round them characters who, like Chief Wiggum, or Apu, or Quagmire, where you kind of know what, what to expect. And I think Cleveland was always very funny and much more of a character-based character on that show, and a lot had not yet been defined about him. And I think a, a fun thing to do about Cleveland with his backstory, with his take on things, it gave us a lot of room to fill in the fill in the empty spaces, um, and that was a fun and challenging thing to do when we were deciding, like Beth and I, you know, who to people his world with, what kind of characters would be best, you know, drawing out different sides of him, or you know, giving him stuff to play against week after week. Um, so I think. 
But he has a very, I think, gent gentle and sincere sweetness to him, which makes it a different kind of character to Peter Griffin. And so we knew, or I think Seth knew, that if he ever did a spin-off of Family Guy, obviously it was gonna, you, know, you weren't going to take Brian Stewie or Peter. Uh, and in a way, you want to you don't want to take people who would seem too much like them either. And I think Cleveland is different enough uh, from Peter that it, it was always going to feel, I think, I hope, like right. a different show, its own show. What are some tips for some people who want to write for TV? The more writing you do, the better. And I think you pick you pick a show that you that you like that you think you could you could write, and you write one or two episodes. You know whether you pick two shows. You know, I would always say to people, you know, there's the so-called multi-camera sitcom and there's the so-called single-camera sitcom. And the single-camera sitcoms are done like movies. So, you know, or one-hour shows. They're filmed, you know, without an audience, not on a stage with the fake fourth wall. You know, shows like Community and, and The Office and all those shows on Thursday night currently versus Two and a Half Men and The Big Bang Theory, which are multi-camera shows with a live studio audience and that fake fourth wall. And those shows typically those two types of shows have, have different paces and uh, slightly different sensibilities. And I always say people, you should write one of each. You know, pick a single camera show that you like, The Office, 30 Rock, Community, whatever it is. Pick a multi-camera show you like, Two and a Half Men, Big Bang Theory, uh, and write one of each. And, and you know, I can't stress enough how important it is to spend the time, not on the jokes, really, at, at the beginning, but on the story. Really have a story, it doesn't have to be complicated, but it has to be kind of interesting. It has to work. It has to have a, you know, a little arc, and ideally something that makes you think, oh, that's an original take on an old-fashioned family situation. Um, and then you sit down and you write it. Because I think the jokes are easier. I honestly always have felt you've always back. You always can go back in and add extra jokes, but you can't fix something if the story's making no sense. And then we can have. You know, a couple of scripts, you know, get it right by as many people as you can. Send it out to agencies, send it to junior executives, whoever it is. My, my sense always has been if there's a really great script, it will get read by someone who can help you. I just think that scripts get circulated, and I think if you have a really good sample, you're doing as much as you possibly can. So. Do you feel it's harder to write for animated shows versus people, things with real actors, shows with real actors? I don't know the answer to that. I think they each have their challenges. I always say about animated shows that it's both a real challenge and a burden to realize that you can type on your in your script, exterior of the moon, and no producer's going to say, we don't have the money to go to the moon. We can do anything. They can draw anything. They can draw crazy, surreal flashes. You can do a dream sequence. You can do the... So, in a way, it's harder. In a way, it's easier because there's no limits on you, but in a way it's harder because there's no limits on you, because if you can't think of something, you're thinking, I can't think of anything in the whole wide world that's worth writing about, and also sometimes you think, well, the, the, the bar is so high if you do a Star Wars parody on a family guy, what do you do the next week? Or if you do, you know, a, a, something on the Simpsons or up, who goes to India just for one joke to meet the CEO of the Quickie Mart, um, you know, you can do anything. But it's both a challenge and a fun thing because there isn't that artificial restriction of we can't set a scene at Dodger Stadium. We'll never be able to rent it for the day. Um, but uh, so I don't know the answer. It's a little different, but I think in, honestly, I think the hardest thing, as I was saying, to do on either show is to come up with an original story. And I think that's hard on both. You know, it, it's, it's easy to write either of the shows, that types of shows, poorly. But I think if you, it, it's, it's it's hard on both to come up with a story that you think will be worth spending a few months polishing and, and then telling. For more exclusive interviews and content, please check out entertainmentlinks.com.